August 28, 2002 at the Tokyo Dome in Japan, Pride FC held one of the largest MMA events ever, the Pride Shockwave, drawing a staggering crowd of 91,107 spectators, making it one of the largest attendances in mixed martial arts history. Yet, in the world of mixed martial arts, the name Pride Fighting Championships might ring a bell. But beneath the thrill and the glamour, a sinister undertow tugged at the foundation of this federation. In the 90s before Pride was born, combat sports thrived on novelty. Fight promoters were hungry for something new, fresh, and exciting. Something that could captivate the Japanese passion. Everything from professional wrestling to kickboxing and mixed martial arts. It was common for fighters with all sorts of backgrounds and reputations to call each other out. One man was commonly targeted with these callouts is none other than Hickson Gracie. One day, Yoji Anjo, a Japanese professional wrestler and future UFC participant, took it upon himself to force Gracie's hand. In a now infamous event, Anjo arrived unannounced at Gracie's Academy in Southern California bringing with him a team of photographers and even a film crew. His bold plan was to force Gracie to live up to his pledge of fighting for honor, not just money. Gracie allowed Anjo to enter but kept the film crew outside. The result of that fight has assumed an almost mythical status due to its elusive recording, and the recording was owned solely by Gracie. Eyewitness accounts depict a brutal encounter with Gracie taking Anjo down, beating him from a full mount position and eventually rendering him unconscious in his own blood, a vivid scene the media captured once Gracie allowed them in. Gracie's chilling remark about the incident later emphasized the distinction between fighting for money and honor. If we fight for money, I'll stop hitting you when you ask me to. If we fight for honor, I'll stop hitting you when I feel like it. News of the fight quickly spread to Japan, fueled partly by the shocking video evidence. This made Gracie an even more enticing prospect for fight promoters. The marketing potential of a showdown between Gracie, a genuine martial artist, and the likes of Takata, a superstar pro wrestler, became irresistible. The promoters at KRS decided to capitalize on this opportunity, and they offered Gracie a proposal he couldn't refuse. A true fight with no fixes or funny business, but with a massive payout. The first fight of Pride FC called Pride 1, Gracie vs Takata was set. The birth of a phenomenon was witnessed as nearly 48,000 spectators flooded the Tokyo Dome to see the inaugural Pride FC event. Position like this and you stay in it. Oh, here we go. He's gonna go for armbar. There it is. Oh, he's got it. He's got it. Takata's got the hands locked. Takata taps out. Gracie stood victorious over the inexperienced Takata, locking him in an armbar just 4 minutes and 47 seconds into the fight. This success signaled the beginning of the Pride Fighting Federation's rise to global prominence. From the start, this organization was different and willing to experiment. It set a grueling rounds format not seen anywhere else, with a first round that lasted a punishing 10 minutes. This demanded not only skill but supreme endurance from its fighters. This was a test of will that engaged audiences worldwide. What made it even better was if a fighter was stalling or not being active enough, they would receive a yellow card, which resulted in a 10% reduction in their fight purse, further motivating a brutal fight. It also featured freak show fights. One example is the fight between Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert Hoist Gracie and sumo wrestler Akabono Taro at Pride 14 in 2001. Despite the significant size difference, Gracie won the match by submission. But Pride FC's success was as meteoric as it was tumultuous. Financial troubles soon dampened initial triumphs, with the federation bleeding money at an alarming rate. And this, and this is my friend, this is Morishita. Naoto Morishita, a charismatic and smart businessman, gave Pride FC a lifeline. However, despite Morishita's influence, the Federation's financial trouble persisted, necessitating funding from questionable sources, mainly the Yakuza. Imposing, elusive, and shrouded in mystery, the Yakuza have long been a force within Japan's criminal underworld. With a history that reaches back to the Edo period, the Yakuza has transformed from groups of gamblers and street vendors into a structured, complex, and powerful criminal organization. 
Their influence spreads wide across various industries, from entertainment to sports, and their dealings are marked by secrecy and sophistication. The enigmatic Yoshinori Watanabe was a pivotal figure within the Yakuza, who allegedly held considerable sway over Pride FC. Leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi, the largest syndicate within the Yakuza, Watanabe was no stranger to the sport. The secretive figure loved fighting and gambling, and Pride FC offered an enticing opportunity for both. However, the Yakuza's involvement in Pride FC was more than a hobby or a business transaction. It was an opportunity to exert control over a popular entertainment platform. Initially, the financial ties between Pride FC and the Yakuza were expertly concealed. Yet, a few suspicious transactions eventually came to light. A string of hefty investments was made into Pride FC from sources that could not be clearly traced, with many insiders suspecting they originated from Yakuza-affiliated enterprises. Shortly after, a sense of dread grew within the Federation, with some speculating that Pride FC was becoming little more than a puppet in the hands of the Yakuza. Stories of fighters and other key individuals being coerced into signing contracts with Pride FC began to circulate. These alleged threats ranged from subtle intimidation to outright physical aggression. This ensured that the Yakuza could control the fighters they were betting on, increasing their odds of winning. Allegations of fight fixing were also rampant. Several bouts were accused of being manipulated to favor certain fighters. There were instances of suspicious refereeing, strange decisions, and suspected cheating. When referees wear an earpiece, I mean, come on, when the referees are wearing an earpiece, there's something dodgy about that because the producers or the owners, the bosses, whatever you want to call them, they're like, hold on, stand them up, put them down, reposition them. There's no need for a referee to have an earpiece in. In addition, Pride FC contracts stated no explicit ban on steroids. They didn't care. They didn't discriminate. In fact, they even encouraged people to take steroids. They didn't care if you were taking steroids, but if you were on drugs, if you were found to be taking cocaine, heroin, or anything like that, that was it. That wasn't good. Steroids, good. Recreational drugs, bad. We were okay with the steroids, but they were bad with the drugs. And if you did, you didn't get your purse at all. You did not get paid. The lack of a rigorous drug testing protocol indicated the Yakuza's willingness to go to any lengths to ensure a profitable outcome. As time passed, this influence kept growing, with the owners being threatened to pay protection money to various Yakuza groups. Failure to do so would result in disruption of events or even violent incidents. With heavy financial trouble and the need to pay the Yakuza to prevent further violence, it was only a matter of time before it all imploded. At 1am on January 9, 2003, a chilling piece of news swept through the MMA world. Naoto Morishita, the president of Pride FC, was found dead. The official verdict was suicide. Morishita was reported to have died by hanging, but the timing and suddenness of his death raised many eyebrows. Rumors started to swirl around Morishita's company, Dreamstage Entertainment, and its financial status. It was alleged that DSC was under immense debt, with the major creditors being none other than the Yakuza. Could it be that Morishita's death was not a simple case of suicide but a desperate attempt to escape from the relentless pressure of mounting debts and Yakuza threats? Adding more fuel to the fire, the handling of Morishita's shares in DSC would have naturally transferred to his wife, yet in a surprising twist, all of his shares were redirected to Nobuyuki Sakakibara and Ishizaka, a Korean-born Yakuza member. Nobuyuki Sakakibara had been instrumental in establishing Pride FC, along with Naoto Morishita and Hiromichi Momos, a key figure and known to those as the Phantom of Pride. In the wake of Morishita's untimely death, it was quickly filled by Ishizaka as the new owner and Sakakibara ascended to the position of president. His ascension seemed to solidify the ties between Pride FC and the Yakuza. The circumstances surrounding Morishita's death were never conclusively proven and the truth remains buried deep beneath layers of secrecy. An incident in November 2003 showcased the dangerous connection between the Yakuza and Pride FC. During an event, Ishizaka and his Osaka crew had a major dispute with Hiromichi Momos and his crew. In a shocking scene, between 100 to 200 armed Yakuza members were present, almost ready to open fire. The standoff not only unveiled the Yakuza's battle as to which group was taking full control over Pride, 
but also marked a turning point in Pride FC's relationship with its clients, who began to question the organization's integrity. The fall of Pride FC began when journalist Seiya Kawamata published the now infamous Inoki Bombaye story. Inoki Bombaye, another fighting federation, had scheduled a New Year's Eve event featuring popular fighter Mirko Krokop. In a move of defiance, Pride FC also organized a competing event for the same night. The Yakuza, always hungry for power and control, allegedly paid Krokop $300,000 to fake a back injury, forcing him to withdraw from the Inoki Bombaye event. They then threatened Krokop, declaring that if he participated in the event, they would no longer sign him to fight in Pride FC. This was not the only case of manipulation and intimidation. Fedor's manager Miro Mijatovic was met with Sakakibara and four Yakuza members at Okura Hotel in Kobe. They held him at gunpoint to sign Fedor's rights over to Pride FC or he was not going to leave Kobe alive. But the final blow came when Japanese television networks stopped airing Pride FC events. This move was reportedly due to the evidence of Yakuza involvement, causing the networks to cut ties in an attempt to distance themselves from any potential scandal. The loss of television coverage was a severe financial hit, drastically reducing its audience and impacting its revenue. Coupled with the growing distrust among fans and fighters alike, the reputation of Pride FC began to crumble, marking the beginning of the end. In the following years, Pride FC struggled to stay afloat. They faced massive financial repercussions eventually leading to their acquisition by Zufa LLC, the parent company of the UFC, in 2007. But the damage was done by then, and the once mighty Pride FC had fallen. In the world of mixed martial arts, Pride FC was once a titan. It brought together cultures, captured audiences, and grew a diverse and passionate fan base across the globe. However, its alleged ties to the Yakuza may have scarred this legacy, and the fall of Pride FC remains a clear tribute to the damage that can be done when sports and crime intertwine. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like and a comment. Remember to also subscribe for more sports stories and hit that notification bell. We'll see you in the next video.